This video is sponsored by uh, you. National Park Diaries is now on Patreon, and you can come help me tell bigger and better park stories. Check the link in the description to see how you can join our Discord, get early ad-free videos, vote on video topics, and my personal favorite, how to join the National Park Diaries book slash movie club. Thank you so much for your support, and now, on with the show. I want you to imagine a maze. A maze of staggering proportions. A maze where you don't just turn left and right, but up and down, in and out. You'll have to navigate hundred foot drops, it will be cold and wet, the ground will shift beneath your feet, and you'll have to squeeze into the tightest of passageways. Oh, and it'll be pitch black dark. I'm talking about a labyrinthine set of passageways, tunnels, canyons, tubes, and shafts forged by the primordial forces of the earth. When all is said and done, these passageways will total more than 420 miles, or 676 kilometers. And that's just what we know of. There's the potential for another 600 miles, nearly a thousand kilometers of passageways still to be mapped. Imagine that. 1,000 miles of cave, 1,600 kilometers of deep, dark, earthen tunnels, hundreds of feet below where you're standing. It's a statistic that's almost impossible to believe. Almost. Because this maze exists. It's actually very famous, perhaps the most famous cave in the world. We're talking, of course, about Kentucky's Mammoth Cave. Protected as a national park since 1941. Well, some of it. The cave is actually so large that it stretches beyond the park's borders. Technicalities. Let's talk about how it got that way. Let's talk about why Mammoth Cave is so freaking big. Let's start with rocks. Very exciting stuff. The particular rocks we're talking about with Mammoth Cave are from a division of geologic time known as the Mississippian period. Now, geologic time is a bit weird. There's all these divisions and subdivisions, and we break it up based on different geological events and what types of organisms we find in the fossil record. For now, all you need to know is that these rocks from the Mississippian period, the oldest ones in Mammoth Cave, are roughly 350 million years old, and they formed underwater. That's right, during this Mississippian period, Kentucky, or what would one day become Kentucky, was flooded under a shallow sea. In this shallow sea, swam billions upon billions of little tiny sea critters, all with calcareous shells. That just means their shells were made primarily of a chemical called calcium carbonate. It's a pretty widespread compound, but for our purposes, just know that when these tiny little sea critters died, these calcareous shells sunk down to the bottom of the ocean, and over the course of millions upon millions of years, they solidified to form rocks. They formed a particular type of rock called limestone, which you guessed it is made primarily of calcium carbonate. Now, at the same time, which again is 350 million years ago, there are rivers and streams flowing into this shallow sea as well. They're bringing with them all these sediments, which are collecting and also depositing on the seafloor. Over time, they solidify to form rocks as well. Same process as before, except they form a type of rock known as sandstone. I know, very exciting stuff, but it's important, so stick with me. These two types of rock, limestone and sandstone, are critical to understanding the geology of Mammoth Cave and why it has grown to such a, uh, mammoth size. All right, next let's move to the Pennsylvanian period. It's another division of geologic time, don't worry about it, just know that we're now around 310 million years ago. The continents are starting to move around, the seas are receding, and the crust is beginning to uplift. By 250 million years ago, the Permian period for all you folks keeping score at home, Kentucky is now above the water. It's part of this dome of arched rock known as the Cincinnati Arch. I don't know why all these features and time periods are named after US states and cities. I don't make the rules, I just tell you what I know. Anyway, Kentucky is now dry. And the bedrock in this area, what would become Mammoth Cave, is made up of those two important types of rock, limestone and sandstone. Those two worked in concert with one another to make Mammoth Cave what it is today. Let's find out why. First thing you have to know about, acid. 
I know, first rocks, now acid. When are we going to talk about caves? But it turns out acid can actually dissolve rocks, especially limestone, and this starts the formation of caves. For Mammoth Cave, that started about 10 million years ago, which is sometime during the Miocene epoch of the Neogene period of the Cenozoic era of the Phanerozoic Eon. I told you, geologic time is weird. Anyway, rainwater. When it interacts with carbon dioxide, which it can pick up from the air or the soil, it will actually turn slightly acidic. It forms a weak acid called carbonic acid. This is actually the same stuff you'll find in your soda, so when your dentist tells you to lay off the Coca-Cola, this is what they're talking about. This is the same acid that formed the world's longest cave. Do with that information what you will. But we're not talking about teeth, we're talking about caves. This carbonic acid, although considered a weak acid, is still strong enough to dissolve a rock like limestone, which is exactly what it's done, not only in Mammoth Cave, but around the world. There's even a name for this type of landscape where the underlying bedrock has been chemically eroded away. It's called karst topography, and it's characterized by the presence of caves, sinkholes, and underground streams and rivers. Mammoth Cave has these in abundance, and it overlays one of the largest karst regions in the world. But that doesn't entirely explain how Mammoth Cave got so big. If there's karst topography all over the world, and caves readily form in this type of landscape, how come other caves haven't gotten as big as Mammoth Cave? Well, Mammoth Cave has a few unique things going for it. For one thing, the type of limestone here is very soluble, meaning it dissolves extra easily in that carbonic acid we talked about. It also rains a lot here, 50 inches or 127 centimeters per year. Remember that rainwater is acidic, so more rain equals more acid equals more cave formation. Then there's the structure of the rocks themselves. See, limestone has these interconnected series of fractures. Vertical fractures are called joints, horizontal ones are called bedding planes. These are essentially weak points in the rock, so when water squirms its way into one of these fractures and starts dissolving it, the process just kind of becomes self-reinforcing. It's like a snowball running downhill, except really slowly because this is, you know, geology. But essentially, once a crack has been sufficiently eroded, more and more water can enter, erosion can happen faster and faster, and the cave can grow bigger and bigger. When you think about Mammoth Cave's confusing labyrinth of passages, just remember that, in many ways, those passages have been preordained by the layout of the rocks. For example, if water erodes away a vertical joint in the rock, you'll find a pit or dome, places that are tall and skinny. But if the water erodes along a horizontal bedding plane, you'll find something like a tube, which is shaped like, well, a tube. It's all just geology. But that's still not the last thing contributing to Mammoth Cave's giant maze of passageways. There's still the question of slope, and don't think I've forgotten about the sandstone either. We'll come back to it, but for now, let's talk about some more places with funny names. Names like the Penny Royal Plateau. This is an area south and east of the park that contains what is called a sinkhole plain. It's also been aptly named the Land of 10,000 Sinks. Because if you look at this place from the air, it looks like a war zone. It's pocked with thousands and thousands of sinkholes. These sinkholes have been created from the collapse of the limestone bedrock below them. And this is where all that water, acidic water, enters the Mammoth Cave system. See, there are very few surface water features in a sinkhole plain. All the water that falls on the earth, which remember this area gets a lot of rain, all this water simply infiltrates through the sinkholes and enters the limestone bedrock, which of course is now going to start dissolving that rock. From there, it's just a matter of slope. Water has to flow to keep dissolving this rock. And the easiest way for it to do that is to flow downhill. Now, I know I said there aren't many surface water features in a landscape like this, but the Green River is an exception. It's an important piece of this puzzle. See, at the same time water has been infiltrating through the sinkhole plain and into the limestone, the Green River has been carving its own valley to the northwest. The effect has been to create a gentle gradient from the sinkhole plain to the Green River, so that when water enters the limestone bedrock, it flows downhill, underground, toward the river. Flowing water means the rock is dissolving, means Mammoth Cave is getting bigger. 
And actually, as the Green River erodes lower and lower into its valley, this gradient becomes more pronounced, which means the water can drop to lower levels of rock and create new sections of Mammoth Cave. Currently, there are five separate levels to Mammoth Cave, each corresponding to a time when the Green River was at a relatively stable level itself. Now, all four of those things, the super soluble limestone, the abundance of water, the interconnected fractures, and the downhill gradient, are all enough to form a cave of considerable size. But the keystone in this arch is actually made of sandstone. I told you we'd come back to it, so let's see how it fits into our story. Up to this point, we've been talking a lot about rocks being dissolved, specifically limestone. Its chemical composition makes it particularly susceptible to chemical erosion. Sandstone doesn't share this same trait. It is in fact more resistant to chemical erosion. And at Mammoth Cave, sandstone ridges sit on top of the limestone. This is an arrangement known as cap rock because, you know, it sits on top like cap. The significance of this sandstone cap rock is that it protects the limestone passages underneath from collapsing in on themselves. Think about the sinkhole plane. There's no cap rock over there, and the limestone has been eroded away to such a degree that it just collapses in on itself, creating a landscape littered with thousands and thousands of sinkholes. That doesn't happen, for the most part, in the Mammoth Cave system because the resistant sandstone protects the limestone passages beneath it. I say for the most part because collapses do inevitably happen. Most notably, the historic entrance to Mammoth Cave was created through a collapse. If you've been to Mammoth Cave or are planning to go, you'll likely enter the cave here. This entrance was created when one of the upper level passages intersected with the valley forming outside of it. Still, collapses are rare, and that's because of the sandstone cap rock. This is also the reason you don't see the more quote unquote traditional cave formations here. The sandstone prevents water from dripping down into the passages from above. That water, should it be allowed to drip, would form stalactites, stalagmites, and other features you typically associate with caves. Now, don't get me wrong, Mammoth Cave does have these, most notably the frozen Niagara. It's just there's not a lot of them. And that's because of the sandstone cap rock. This is the key to Mammoth Cave's longevity. As the water has flowed down to the lower levels of the cave, the now dry upper level passages remain stable. Those are the passages we now walk through on cave tours, and which enabled researchers to keep exploring this incredible underground wonderland. And it's all thanks to a unique combination of rock and water. Millions of years of formation and erosion have culminated to produce, at this moment, the longest cave in the world. A cave that has captivated people for centuries. It has drawn the attention of so many. They've been touring these caves, exploiting them, fighting over them, backstabbing each other, scheming against one another, people have died trying to exploit these caves. Which is why next time, we are talking about the Kentucky Cave Wars. I'll see you then. Hey there, National Park Diaries is now on Patreon. I've got some really cool stuff over there if you're looking to support the channel further. You can get videos early and ad-free, get exclusive trip advice for your national park travels, join the Discord, vote on the videos I make on the channel, and even join the NPD book slash movie club. Head to patreon.com slash nationalparkdiaries to learn more. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.